always there. Um, the section on tracker for clinical use and supervision. I'm Mike Frost, the product manager for Tracker. Um, I come from the public health side. I've worked in public health since uh, 2007. And my first large project uh, was about collecting data for malaria that was coming from clinical records. And uh, my sin was that what I ended up designing was a quarterly survey that was done in 18 countries every year. Uh, which was a terrible way to get the kind of data that was needed. Uh, it consisted of teams going out into the field and randomly pulling patient files to capture all of this data and then submit it as a survey. It never fed into the HMIS. It was basically data that was going back to kind of the donor level. It was not really being used extensively in country, and it cost over a million dollars a year per country. So since that time, I have tried to change my ways and focus much more on creating systems for countries that will actually serve the country's needs and not just at the decision-making level, but all the way down to where the data are actually generated, which is the clinical level. And it's a driving belief on the product management side of Tracker that you can collect all of the data you need at the point of care without turning it into a massive burden. And so that's, that's the underlying philosophy is to try to make it something that actually benefits the people collecting the data, provides them with the, the kinds of tools that will make their job easier rather than more difficult. So I'm just going to do a, a tiny intro here uh, to get us all on the same page of how we're talking about Tracker in terms of clinical use. So I'm, I'm creating some slides here from uh, GFF uh, that they were presenting to the World Bank. I'm asked this question pretty much every time that I present, is Tracker an EMR? So I'm just going to show you at least how somebody else decided to describe uh, Tracker versus EMRs. I think everybody is familiar with the EMR, and you know what the EMR is, and you wonder whether collecting uh, data through Tracker might also make Tracker an EMR. But at least under the definitions that they used here, they distinguish between trackers as a category, uh, not talking specifically about the HS2 tracker, but saying in general, there's a category of uh, data collection tools that can be described as trackers, which are much more targeted than an EMR. So the concept being that in uh, the kinds of uh, Lower level health facility, community health workers, kind of the periphery and where a lot of the services are being provided, those are areas where they're not likely to be able to use an EMR. The EMR may not be appropriate. It's a, it's a much heavier tool. Whereas at least how we see both public health uh, programs being monitored and managed and funded, it's often more disease specific, it's health program specific. They at this moment in time have an initiative of funding and a cadre of health workers for malaria. And they're ready now for a malaria system. And so the idea behind a tracker is that you can build a clinical facing tool for that one specific program, very lightweight, easy to use, can capture the required data elements there, can be used for things like decision support while also reporting up the chain. So always explicitly in the kind of use of this clinical data, we'd like it to ideally feed into the reporting requirements as well. So a little bit of a distinction, but also thinking that in those areas, the next group that sees this malaria system would be the TV group. And they think, oh, we want one too. So you add on TV, and then the HIV group wants to get involved, and then ANC. And after a few of these, you start to see you created a full shared health record at that site, or at least at that level of the system. And in that sense, it starts to look a lot more like an EMR, but you've built it kind of one step at a time, and hopefully you're feeding it into a shared health record uh, that is also being used at the hospital level, that is being used to link to the EMRs, um, and that's kind of what we're thinking of, that the direction is that, that many countries are going. We've seen an explosion of this kind of use of EHS2 Tracker in the last couple of years. We have 85 countries that are using Tracker on a, a larger national scale, and many of them are using this at a kind of clinical phasing scale. Just uh, wanted to say that we, we keep in mind the, the few recommendations that so far have come out of WHO with regards to digital interventions for health systems. 
And these uh, seven or eight are the ones that we think specifically Tracker is uh, targeting and able to provide a solution for. In fact, maybe the one that we're talking about the most today and that is most on our minds as we design Tracker is this kind of combined recommendation that is digital tracking of patients combined with decision support and targeted client communication. And you can see in this recommendation, we're talking about data, data that goes up, we're talking about decision support for the person that's collecting the data, and we're talking about information going to the client for the patient themselves. So we really do have in mind this, that the entire kind of universe of who needs this data and where it comes from, we're trying to support them in a single application, which would really reduce the reporting burden, while also increasing quality of care, supporting the continuum of care, and enabling the patient uh, to have more ownership over their data. My last slide before I turn it over to colleagues to share what they're actually doing and, and what they're doing with Tracker uh, is to say that this space is very challenging. Um, this report, some of you may be familiar with, came out a couple of years ago, talking about how the U.S. has spent $36 billion on EMRs and it's been an abysmal failure. And I loved this quote uh, that was included because this sounds like it could have come from any of the people that I'm working with all around the world. Every single idea was well-meaning, potentially of societal benefit, but the combined burden of all of them hitting clinicians simultaneously made office practice basically impossible. I've heard the same story all around the world over and over. Clinics that, you know, only half the day can see patients because they spend the rest of the day filling out reports and doing all of the data collection that they're supposed to do. Nurses that are being given multiple devices from different health programs trying to report everything through these that in a way that is not useful to them at all. And so we, we again, keep this very much in mind as we're designing factor, trying to make it a purpose-built tool that can be very tailored to your specific use case, and match the workflow that the clinician actually wants to use, and can collect the data that will be useful again, up the, up the chain and also out to the patient itself. So with that, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna turn it over to Nina from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, who's going to talk to us a bit about uh, the use of tracker for antenatal care and applying the digital adaptation kit from WHO. So. Thank you, hi everyone. Um, my name is Nina uh, Smith. I'm here today on behalf of the Institute of Public Health, and I will talk to you a little bit about the uh, tracker for campaigns and supervision. I have a cheat sheet, so yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the WHO has published um, international guidelines for digital health information and uh, interventions for um, different health domains um, aimed at improving healthcare uh, delivery and strengthening uh, health systems. Um, so there are, uh, however, a number of challenges related to this. Um, uh, for instance, monitoring of um, uh, guideline adherence and non-standard um, contents of DHIs, and also um, the lack of implementation research and evidence uh, specifically related to um, DHIs and for the guidelines. Um, so to ensure um, uh, countries can effectively benefit um, from digital uh, health investments, uh, DHIs are um, designed to facilitate um, the accurate reflection of the WHO uh, guidelines within the digital systems uh, countries are adopting. So the DHH uh, case are operational and software neutral, and they're also um, an attempt to standardize um, the uh, health content for the DHI. Yes. Yeah. So um, the evidence based uh, policies and health systems um, interventions for antenatal care, it's a mouthful. It's also known as the EPOSIT. Um, it's a research uh, project for ANC in Uganda, which is conducted in collaboration with the University of Oslo. 
at the University of Bergen, uh, Mokere University in Uganda, his Uganda, and uh, Sismak and King's College in London. And the project is funded by um, the Research Council of Norway to UNHCR. Um, so in this project, we have the uh, ambition to assist uh, Uganda with um, better evidence um, to improve essential services uh, for pregnant women and their babies. Um, so the project is twofold. It's um, supporting Uganda in adopting um, to uh, WHO guidelines in line with national guidelines and policies, uh, providing uh, recommendations on antenatal care for a positive um, pregnancy experiments and recommendations on digital intervention um, for health uh, system strengthening. So we will provide um, uh, these through implementation by uh, building local innovations on the WHO and DIK for NC, uh, co-designing with users and stakeholders, um, and integrated um, in the national DHI2 um, health information system and intervention science by conducting a cluster randomized trial, control trial um, of the transition from a four ANC context to eight ANC context. Yes, so the DIK is part of the SMART guidelines, and uh, these are a comprehensive uh, set of reusable. Um, digital health components, uh, for instance, uh, interoperability standards, um, code libraries, and algorithms. Um, these transform the guideline adaptation and, and implementation process um, to preserve fidelity and uh, accelerate uptake. So they inform uh, guideline developers, um, technologists and countries in the transition from paper-based uh, systems to smart digital systems. Um, yes. And this also um, aid the countries to more effectively um, and accurately adopt and benefit from the WHO uh, health and data recommendations through the digital systems. Which is the last bit. Uh, for this uh, particular DIK for the ANC, uh, the requirements are based um, on systems that provide the functionality um, of digital tracking and decision support and include, among other components, um, core data elements and decision support logic. Um, and this documentation will be used in this project. Uh, with the NIH uh, to include um, international WHO uh, recommendations for uh, ANC in the Adult Tracker to uh, improve the government health system, um, informing evidence-based policies and other initiatives. So hopefully this will result in uh, better overall health care for uh, pregnant women and their babies. Um, the work Thank you Rick, for that setup and background for this topic. Uh, my name is Brian O'Donnell. I work at the University of Oslo as an implementation advisor, mostly on uh, DHIC metadata packages. But for a number of years, I've been working with the uh, University of Public Health on adapting um, adapting antenatal care guidelines into DHIS2 tracker modules for clinical care. Um, and so I'm going to walk through a bit of the process of adapting this uh, DAK that we did into a, a global generic DHIS2 tracker module. So um, within the DAK, you can see that it has a number of components here. Uh, the one that was very helpful for us was this uh, component five of uh, core data elements, because these are essentially spreadsheets that describe um, an ideal uh, an ideal system for collecting data on antenatal care, expressing the, the WHO guidelines. And so you can see here that um, as these core data elements are described um, for something like gestational age, what are the types of ways that you can collect gestational age? And then also some of the descriptions, <coughs> definitions. It also includes things like ICD-10 codes and low-link codes, options and option sets. And so it's a very rich resource for people who want to adapt WHO guidelines for a local context. So if we were going to actually use this in a situation like the Uganda trial that Ian was describing, what are the actual steps that we would take? 
I mean, imagine here you have, um, apologies for the player slide, but you have uh, a matrix where you have global guidance and local adaptation, and you have software agnostic guidelines like the WHO uh, DAK and very software specific um, templates you could call them, right? So in uh, we are trying to adapt this global guideline in a generic, um, generically expressed way, the DAK, into a locally context, a local context of the Uganda healthcare setting with a DHIS2 application. So the process that I will describe today is about transitioning from the DAK into a DHIS2 system. And we used this, uh, the DAK core data elements. They also had user profiles and uh, user personas. Um, as well as business processes and workflows that were included, as well as the L4 of the SMART guidelines, which is the um, open SRP demo application, which we could use as a template for uh, configuring a DHIS2 program. Um, so the DHIS2 mother program that actually was like, produced through this process, so it's been about 18 months of adaptation. Um, we have 17, in fact, we have to do seven different program stages and 76 total sections. That's a very large DHIS2 tracker program because we're trying to adapt this for a clinical context, right? Not only do we have a number of different data elements that we're importing into this uh, DHIS2 system, but we also have a number of program rule logics for clinical decision support that are a part of the DHIS that we should try to express in DHIS2. Um, so these are 260 program rules as well. Um, as I mentioned, the open SRP module was very helpful for getting an idea of this uh, workflow that is expressed through this uh, WHO uh, DAK. And uh, we were able to actually sort of mimic a little bit of the work through things like program rules. So in DHS2, for example, we have, um, you see like the, what they call the registration data elements in the DAK, that these are actually tracked into the attributes, right? So you can enroll a client in the, in the system. And the first thing that you want to do before you can enter any data for this client is do a quick check. You want to make sure that this woman does not have any danger signs. That means that she needs to be referred to a emergency facility or to a higher level of care. So we can actually say hide these other stages by program rules to make sure that uh, there are no danger signs for this patient. And then we can open up all of the other stages that would be involved with it. And you can see that there's a number of different um, sections as well, like moving on to profile and history. And there you see the, um, the date, same data elements that were in its DAK module for calculating gestational age, right? Um, and so these are now in a, a DHIS2 program, um, which we plan to make uh, publicly available and for others to, others to use and adapt. But the, there are a number of different uh, challenges that come with this process um, of just taking this global generic uh, spreadsheets and then actually translating them into DHIS2. So the first is like deciding what is a TEI attribute and what is a data element? Um, how do we actually describe what is in the first visit of this stage versus a routine visit, right? Do we want to have like a separate ANC1 program stage or make it repeatable? Um, and then I mentioned quick check, but um, one of the great be benefits of having this DAK was that we could do bulk imported metadata by CSV. Um, there were additional technical challenges of say like okay, maybe the field maps aren't exactly the same into DHIS2. Um, so this is something that you kind of have to do learn by doing. Um, the other big one was there was no multiple select uh, option in DHIS2, so finding workarounds for that was a challenge. But one of the key things I want to bring up here is that um, we would have had these same challenges with adapting the guidelines if we had actually used uh, a fire uh, adapter, for example, right? If we actually used this, um, the L3 guidelines, which are the um, implementation guide of fire, we would have had many of these same internal discussions about how do you model multiple selecting DHIS2, right? We would have had the same questions of how should we do a repeatable program stage and, uh, for antenatal care, for example. And so a lot of these uh, topics that we had, uh, a lot of these topics that were brought up during the transition from CSV into DHIS2, we, we had to find workarounds, right? So for example, I mentioned that the CSV file included well-link and ICD-10 codes. And there's no field in DHIS2 to include like the ICD-10 code, but you can update uh, by like a custom attribute for all the data elements, these ICD-10 codes. So now if the country were to adopt this, uh, this program in our own context, 
then they can find some other ways to use these IC kind of codes to integrate with other systems. So that's one, one sort of workaround. Um, I did mention earlier about like the, the Pyro implementation guide and also this, um, the L4, the, it's called the um, uh, template software or, um, or oh, uh, sorry, the executable code is called. Um, and these were, these are helpful to sort of get a sense of the, the type of structure um, that you can uh, you can actually have with your program, and it's just another expression of these WHO guidelines. The one thing that we weren't able to do, and this is kind of how it relates to uh, to this uh, session, is that um, if you're actually going to create a global version of a clinical tracker system, the one thing that's very locally contextual are clinical care algorithms. So there's a lot of work that goes into developing program rules and workflows for something like um, preeclampsia for a moment, right? And so if we're going to um, if we're going to build a global generic system and then go into the local adaptation, maybe we can just skip that global step, have a sort of skeleton architecture, and then the local country or the, the country partners can build program rules. For example, here's like an example of preeclampsia and severe hypertension based on their own uh, country guidelines. So this is one way in which uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between global guidelines, local adaptation, and also a generic uh, expression of, of software standards and a DHIS2 implementation. Um, so I'm a bit over time, but uh, thank you. And I think I'll move to the next session now and we can take questions after. Just a warning, we are likely to run over time on this session, but the next thing is lunch. So if you'd like to stay with us, we, we want to make sure that we give the presenters enough time. There's also a community of practice link where you can be posting questions now and we'll be trying to answer throughout the session. So we'll we'll try to get some questions in. But yes, turning over to Leon. Good morning. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Leona Rosenblum, and I'm here representing the Country Health Information Systems and Data Use Project, which is a USAID-funded uh, five-year program looking at data use and health information systems globally. Um, and I'm here today to talk about digital approaches to support and supervision. Um, I think, as uh, you know, this session is about tracker and um, we're really excited about some of the existing implementations of Tracker for supervision, um, but also wanting to, to sort of plant the seed in all of your minds that um, while we often think about Tracker for the clinical health record, light EMR sort of approach, that it's actually also a powerful tool for um, super for supervisors and for monitoring health worker performance, providing feedback, um, longitudinal data driven tracking of performance. So um, that's where we're heading. Just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll just explain a little bit more about what Chisu is, uh, and then talk about this activity that we're working on. And then I, I'm really going to spend most of my time talking about the, the framework that we're building out around digitizing supported supervision. Um, talk a little bit about what's already being done, what could be done with DHIS2 and specifically with Tracker, and then about next steps where I hope um, maybe some of us can all collaborate in the future. Um, so as I mentioned, Chisu is, is a project that's really focused on country health information systems. We're trying to make sure we're trying to support countries to have actionable data available that is being used to drive health decision making at all levels of the health system. And we do that by looking across four objectives, which I think are, are well aligned with everything that we're talking about here this week. Um, strengthening governance and the enabling environment, um, increasing availability and interoperability of the, the data and the information systems themselves. Um, increasing the demand and use of health data and information systems, and then strengthening organizational capacity of, of partners and, and host country governments to, to do this work going forward. Um, the activity that I'm talking about here today is around, uh, is, is looking at developing a framework and some guidance documentation around 
on how countries can look at digitizing their support and supervision system. So what we've been working on is a landscape assessment, looking at all of the different ways that support and supervision has been digitized in a variety of contexts so far. Um, we've done that through a document review and a lot of consultation, including with colleagues here at the University of Oslo, which is how uh, we had the idea that this was actually a relevant uh, topic to, to, to submit an abstract for for this conference. Um, and then we're working on this uh, framework and guidance document. So I, I do want to be clear that this is about, um, we're trying, we're putting together guidance that we hope will be a useful way for countries to think about how to digitize either components or the whole of a supported supervision system. We are not developing any sort of application out of this. We think that countries um, have a variety of, of clinical and aggregate data systems already in place and which pieces of that and how to digitize them together in a way that will be interoperable and that will meet country needs is going to be different in every context. So we're, we're putting forward that, that framework, that skeleton of how you can think about it and what to keep in mind when you're looking at digitizing one piece and where all those other parts might need to fit together. But um, just just to be clear, we're not we're not putting out um, an application. Um, so what are we talking about when we say digitizing supportive supervision? Um, I have a feeling that uh, if I asked for a show of hands of everyone here who had heard of the term supportive supervision, you, you would probably all raise your hands. Um, but we find that it's actually quite hard to find an official sort of formal definition of supportive supervision. I think what we can all agree on is we're talking about a, a set of processes and activities that involves a health worker, their direct supervisor, and someone who's managing a health program, facility, or project, right? So we've got these three personas who are involved. Depending on the level, you might have a community health worker. Their supervisor might be at the health facility, and their manager might be at the health facility themselves or at the district. Um, at other levels, it might be a, a health worker who's at a hospital, and their, their supervisor might be from the district level, and the manager of the program might be at the regional or national level, right? So there's a variety of constellations, but um, you know, in general, we, we're looking at the interplay of these three actors. Um, and when you think about what is supportive supervision, it involves these three actors that, that we talked about conducting a variety of activities, right? There's a preparation, planning, and budgeting process around supervision. What facilities need to be supervised? How much does it cost to get there? Where is the fuel coming from? Um, which ones have I been to recently? Which ones are really hard to get to in the rainy season? So I better go before it starts raining. Um, there's also a reporting process, both before and after the visits, looking at data that has come in, looking at data that's missing, looking at the data that you collected when you were out at your visit. When you're actually there at the point of care or at the at the facility with the, the supervisee, the health provider, it's a mixture of direct visit observation, uh, inspection of the facility, interviews with the health provider, sort of spending that time with the provider in the facility, getting information that isn't available to you when you're sitting at your office in the district. Um, and then based on the, that sort of information gathering and observation, there's sort of immediate points and follow-up points of feedback that can be part of this process, right? On, on the job training, refresher content that can be shared with the health worker. Um, there can be follow-up. Oh, I'm noticing that there's a stock out. I need to, I need to follow up with the supply chain person responsible at my level. Um, there can be problem solving, coaching. Um, and other sorts of support uh, and joint joint consensus building between the supervisor and the supervisor. Um, and so when you think about all of those pieces, I think what has jumped out to us as we, as we are looking at this, there's, there's digital interventions that can help with all of these things, right? 
Um, and so next slide, sorry, I'm going to do that a little bit here. Um, but we're trying to talk, think through what are all of these individual digital, digital health interventions that can support all of those tasks that go into a supported supervision system. So, um, and I think some of my, sorry about the formatting, but so if you're looking at um, in the planning and uh, reporting and, and preparation process, you know, pulling in data from other systems so that you can prioritize which facilities you go to based on low performance according to their aggregated health service delivery data that's already available in your DHIS2 based HMIS system, right? That's that that data source can help you in the planning. When you go out to actually do supervision, um, having your data in, having the health worker that you're supervising be a case and tracker where you can be tracking their um, their performance over time. You can see where they were strong, where they were weak last time, what were some of the issues last time, what were your follow-up actions as a supervisor? Did you take them? What were their follow-up actions as a health provider? Did they take that, right? Um, as opposed to what we see often on paper systems um, or on less developed digitized systems, it's a single snapshot, right? It's a piece of paper uh, checklist or it's a capture checklist, but it's not longitudinally tracking over time and then you lose that follow-up and consistency piece. Um, there's also a huge opportunity to look at digital training materials and inter both for the supervisor to bring with them to the facility to look at together with the provider or to push out to devices after after the session um, to help follow up on areas of weakness. So um, I'm not going to name every single of the green uh, spots on there because there's there's a lot of different points. So I think the general uh, the general point that I want to make is when you think about the whole of a supervision system with all those components listed on the left side, there are a lot of different entry points that you could digitize and countries tend to be taking pieces of them at a time. Um, and I think that's probably the most appropriate way to bring any of this forward. But thinking of it as a whole, as you start with, okay, we're going to build this longitudinal case management system. Um, but where will we eventually want to be pulling data in from? What kinds of follow-up actions will we want to be able to track? Um, it's a helpful, a helpful process. Um, so I wanted to just, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to just flag one example that's already being done using the HIS2 and, and specifically tracker, which is the HNQIS system that was developed by DSI. Um, but it's being used um, or is being developed as well with support from the University of Oslo and is, is running in, in many countries already. And they have built out um, components that help with planning, assessing, improving, and monitoring. So that's how they've broken out those four categories. Um, and it's a little blurry and hard to see, but you know, this is pretty look the, the yellow one is looking at um, as a checklist to watch, you know, what happened during the counseling session and the testing session, and did the health worker actually accomplish these activities? And then the one, the blue one, is showing um, actual scoring in terms of quality of care. So it's, you know, based on the data that you're capturing while you're observing the point of care visit, you're actually real time providing a score, and then you can share that right, right while you're there with the health worker. Um, there's a lot of documentation available on this particular system, um, and I think there's a lot of work going on to make it available uh, as a core DHIS2 product as well, and, and to make it easier for countries to take this on. Um, so if that's something you're interested, I'm happy to help connect you to the right folks too, who might be able to help with that. Um, I'll just wrap up by saying we're going to have a, a draft document of this framework to share with everyone for consultation in the next month or so. Um, and we'd really love your feedback, your thoughts on um, whether this is helpful framing, um, how you might be able to use it. And then next year, we'll be working with countries that are um, 
already developing uh, different types of supported supervision digital tools um, to look at those in the context of this framework and think about how um, those tools might fit into a larger digitized supported supervision system. So if you're if, if any of the countries where you're working might be interested in participating with that in that activity, please let me know and we're we're happy to cooperate. So thank you and uh thank you. So our final speaker is uh, Ruby Jeremy Dorr, which I probably yeah. did not yeah. pronounce correctly. Coming to us from uh, Haiti, and uh, had troubles with his flight, so we we reaccommodated for this session. So please stick around so we can uh, hear the full presentation if you're able to. And again, if you have questions, please try to find it on the community of practice. The link for this session. We'd love to interact with you there. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Tommy Dorr. I come from Haiti. It will be more easier to make this presentation in French. So, French is my mother tongue. So, in a short, on a short, with a short time, and I will be in front of my short English, I will try to make this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, we, we are going to talk about um, the TV tracker here from the, the database to um, the DHIS2 DHIS tracker. So, what we did, what was the reality in Haiti, which step, which step we used to go forward, and where we are uh, right now. Um, uh, okay, for the overview for the presentation, we are going to, we are going to talk um, quickly about the Haiti TV program overview. And we are going to talk about the TV program digital transformation. Um, we are going to talk about the engagement towards sustainability, the challenges, and some key programs extension. That's okay. You can understand me. So it's the reality of the of TV program overview. We have the high TV providers in America, and in 2004 there were there, there were um, 12. 1,097 pulmonary and coffee cases in Haiti. And then that was the reality. The mortality, the mortality is uh, high, 58 for 100,000, despite the fact that tuberculosis deaths are only reported. Um, um, the national TB program works to control mitigation of resistance and TBHR coefficient. In doing so, close collaboration with the district and the national network of laboratories is needed. The major weakness of the program is static information. Uh, Little information is available at central level that inform program implementation and the, and the monitoring of the activities. So, um, what is the reality right now in Haiti? The TV data were only available after each quarter and were of two quarters. What we did every three months, they called off the facility with the register to have a meeting and to discuss about data and about the program. So the, at the national level, we have contact, we have the contact with the data, the TV data every three months. So we don't have enough time to make the data consistency. So we don't have enough time to make the report and to share data at the national level for decision making. That was the reality. Um, so what we what is the, the main objective when we make the TB tracker um, tuberculosis? It's to improve data availability and timeliness, improve overall TB data quality, improve availability and quality of the TB program monitoring indicators, decrease data collection tools twenty costs to 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 print the the registered minimum. Yeah, and, and Haiti is a poor country. And increase the use of TV data to improve patient care management and service delivery. What we did, first of all, we like like I like said, um, tracker is not in EMR. So we select the register. What kind of the register that we are using on the TV program? Um, there's a card that 
the TVKs and the will to reform. So when a person have uh, have uh, um, tuberculosis, pulmonary um, positive or negative, or or extra pulmonary tuberculosis, they give they give to the person a card in the infection card for all the monitoring for each one of you. Okay, I can say one of you right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they use the pharmacosensitive register. Influence is pharmacosensitive, so in English it's pharmacosensitive register, okay, to register each, each in this case. And we have a register for each contact. So if we have a case, we have to, 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 to track all the contact. So we have a register for the contact. And for HIV, TB, HIV co infection, we need the EIH prophylaxis register in French. Um, in French, it's uh, register, register the the prophylaxis alien, okay, and it's for TB, uh, HIV co-infection, and at, 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 at the end, we have a special register for multi resistant TB. So, what we did is the configuration inside the DHS2 for, for, the, for the four registers. That's the reality. <laughs> So <laughs> we have to store all the resources. We have to 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 print this. It was very very difficult. And then, what was the approach? So for the world, we have to, to understand the norm and protocols and the algorithm of the program because we have to create stage inside the education school. So for for that, we have to work with the the PNLT is the program, national program that, that manages the tuberculosis program heavily at the, at the Ministry of Health. And UEP is the unity responsible for health information system. We are working. So we have to work together to understand the norm, protocols, algorithms, and so on and so forth, and to create this type this safety inside the DHS school. We make the configuration of four teams register using the DHIS tracker. And the TB care and treatment protocol are used for to, 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 to make the configuration inside the DHS tracker and to create the link between all different registers. That means when I have a first stage and in, in, in that case inside the sensitive register, so I make a link between the contact registers and the HR if the person is an HR case, I make I make the link between the um um, um, INH prophylaxis register and I make the link between the mid resistant um, register. That means I don't have to for each for each person to make the data entry. So with the system, I track the person and I track the contact. And if the if the person is if the patient, sorry, if the, if if the person is if on um, HIV uh, an HIV patient, I can put put put, put him directly on the on the INH prophylaxis, and if the patient um, takes drugs and develops some resistance to the drug, I can track him, track, track, track him and put him on the multi resistant register. So that's the process. Uh, it, was, it wasn't very easy to make it because we need advocacy. <laughs> and what we make as a trend, a trend of healthcare to the use of the TB tracker for personal. Medical training is was um it was it's, it was uh, it was very easy to make it because at the facility level the nurse it doesn't uh the, the nurse was very hard person so train nursing nurses at the facility level to use tablet in terms of that tablet you have to train we train, we we train, we we train, <laughs> supervision, supervision. So what, what we made we, we, at the national level, we, we create a data center. It's not, no, it's not a data center, a call center. So every every week we have to call directly the nurse at the facility level to see what's wrong with the data. Why you don't you don't make the data out here? And then to make the monitoring, it was micro monitoring, it wasn't easier, but we make it. And then at the, at the, at the we, we made um, training at the district level because at the district level they make the coordination, the supervision of the, all the facilities. And 
We buy tablets with the USID support and, and CDC. And, and we have tablets with SIM card, with internet, to give to the facility users to direct data entry directly. And we continue data quality assessment and lesson learning meeting. So even though every week we may call to know what happened at the facility level, every three more, every every three more, we have meetings, special meeting with the with all the facilities at the district level to make the data assessment, to measure the data consistency, and so on and so forth. So that's in terms of technology, what we did at the we have the TB person file TB users, okay. And we use the dash tracker to have analysis dashboard, data for laboratory entries, data for drug forecasting, data for donor reporting, data for lab entries, data for case management, and data for patient management. <laughs> <laughs> so here is the potential. We have a lot of partners. So we have to make advocacy, to make coordination, and sometimes to fight with partners <laughs> to, to, to follow the risk of a guy. It's not easier. I can fight. We are fighting. <laughs> so, what is the research ultimately now? So, an increasing number of patients are now being monitored through the system from um, 30,000 in the second quarter of, of 2019 to more than 74,000 as of today. All 203 TB sites are electronically monitoring patients and that are for clinical decision making, program management, TB drug forecasting, and reporting purposes. There are 100 active users of the system and for 40, for, um, 40 non ministry users and nine different NGOs and international organizations. Uh, that's the tendency of the number of cases, number of TV patients on a track um, 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 between 2018 and 2021. So, what is this the engagement in, in, in terms of sustainability? So with the uh, with one work with the, with the district level to see to to assess the data consistency, see some um, see how the 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 nurses fill the registers and what the data entry are making on the system. Um, it's uh, at the national level we make data consistency. And we assess the data and to make feedback at the district level and facility level. This is the dashboard that we create using the dashes, the, the DHS tracker TV program. What is the challenge? We need for what is human resources capacity building at facility level. What, what, like I said, at the facility level, the nurses for the TV program is not. Very young person, so you have to train, train in mixed supervision. Um, other availability, reliable internet quantity and quality of coverage on the area. At the on the countryside, even though we have we have the tablet with which team card, so we don't have a good connectivity in there. So we we use the Android version of the DHIS tracker. That means we can make the data entry without internet and go on the area that's connectivity in the upper uh, It's not easier, so <laughs> we will make it. Making it necessary for data quality in real time data access with the, with the problem of internet connectivity and the capacity of the human resources at the facility, at the facility level to the data entry, and that affects the quality of the data we, are, we have on the system. The coordination of district supervisory world improve facility data quality and the use of the TV data at district level and facility level for decision making as a challenge in Haiti, political context, and country security issues. Sometimes it is very difficult to the, for, the, at the facility, to the, for the nurses to go to the facility level because they are again the security violence and that affects the, the, the performance of the system. Program extension, and the first one is the ability to track TB vaccination in children, Mr. G. Ability to track TB patient COVID-19 vaccination status, status. Um, integration with the community health information system, 
We are using the, the tracker to the the, the chief community of the system for the community based ecosystem that what what for um for the community health workers. Okay, they give them tablet for the wallet cost and make make and make, make the data entry directly. So at the wallet cost, the, the, the community health workers can 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 give drugs to a, a to the patient, right? So we have to make the link with the community health information system and what we are using at the facility level because the tracker for TV we are using, are using at the facility level. So we, are, we have to work to make this design. Um, include management dashboard for head of the DB program at the level to improve facility supervision, testing and your, and your capability management. Increase, increase the number of the TV point of service with direct access to the TV tracker for patient management. Integration of the TV tracker data into the CAPTCHA meter. CAPTCHA meter is a mapping of all the facilities in the kind of service that is available at facility level. Okay, so we have to make the track to the tracker in with the, the this mapping to see where the tuberculosis service are available and what is the reality for each facility. And improve TV tracker analysis, visualization. And interpretation of data to inform decision making. I think that all. I, I hope that my English were very clear. <laughs> <laughs>